welcome everybody here in the room and also at uh, and in our Zoom room to the uh, next session of our um, lecture series here at the Center for Advanced Studies, Alternative Rationality and Evolutionary Practices from a Global Perspective. I am thrilled and thrilled to welcome Jamie Edwards today to this session, who is joining us from Phoenix, Arizona. Um, and I will briefly introduce him. So he uh, is, and please correct me if anything that I say is wrong, because I kind of Google will help me to compile it, but uh, who knows? Um, so if my latest information that I got here from the net is right, he's now associate director of the Melikian Center for Russian European and for oh, not sure for uh, and it's for Yashka, Russian and European studies, is that correct? Uh, Russian, Eurasian, and Eastern European studies, yes. Okay, Eurasian and European studies. So um, he's also director of the Critical Language Institute at the Malikian Center and a clinical assistant professor of religious studies at Arizona State University. He received a PhD in uh, 2021 uh, from Arizona State University in the field of religious studies with a dissertation with the interesting article Hunting Baraka. The spiritual materiality and the material spirituality reconfiguring the Indonesian Islamic landscape. He was majoring in the field of anthropology of religion um, and also the history of Islam in Indonesia and the anthropology of Islam. He obtained his master in 2012 from the University of California, Riverside, in religious studies, where he was specializing in Islamic mysticism, uh, but also in fields such as uh, history of Southeast Asia and lived religion. And his BA um, was also in, in the field of religious studies. He is, I got to know him actually at a conference in, at the northernmost University of Europe in Tromsø in 2018, where he was giving this very fascinating talk linking themes of authority and, if I recall it right, the smellscapes and ensemble anthropology, which was the link that we barely see in studies of religious authority. And we immediately connected, and I'm really glad that we. Although it has been a while now that, that we are able to continue the, you know, with the contact and to remain in touch. And he's somebody who really took the smellscape and center of anthropology uh, seriously, while many of us are kind of teaching it in our courses and mentioning it, he really put it to practice and, uh, and, and that links to a very deep participant observation in his fieldwork uh, that, that he will uh, tell us about today. Um, I, I mean, he has maybe just to read one or two publication titles also. That, so yes, uh, for example, published in the American Journal of Islamic Social Science, an article called Smelling Baraka, Everyday Islam and Islamic Nativity, or another publication, Re-Enchanting the Material, Technological Manifestations of Baraka, or yet another one, Pilgrimage Sites as Mobile Cities, Islamic Piety on the Move. Uh, there's much more that I could say, uh, but uh, you can also look it up uh, on his web page. And uh, I'm very happy that you accepted our invitation, Jamie, and uh, the floor is yours. Perfect. Um, you know, first of all, uh, Dominic, you've been just sort of a, someone that has supported me from afar uh, for a very long time, uh, who probably knew, who seemed to understand my own potential way before I did. Um, and at, you know, maybe I'll fail and, and you'll never invite me back. But um, I'm, I'm very just sort of I'm just sort of overwhelmed with gratitude um, uh, for this for this opportunity. Um, so, again, my name is uh, James Edmonds, but you can call me Jamie or Dr. J if you're feeling formal. I, I do currently serve as the director of the Critical Language Institute, providing uh, intensive uh, linguistic training in over 14 languages in over eight countries, uh, including the United States. Um, I serve as the Associate Director of the Malikian Center for Russian, Eurasian, and Eastern European Studies. We are a national resource center, as designated by the Department of Education, um, and a Clinical Assistant Professor of Religious Studies. The uh, the clinical designation in front of my title, um, you know, I don't really know what it means. Uh, I've tried to figure it out. Um, it means I have an academic appointment um, with a very heavy administrative load. Uh, so my academic work has is sort of tied to my administrative work, uh, and I often have to think of my academic work differently. And so it's it, it really is an amazing privilege today to to create, perform, and imagine. Um, I try to take these these opportunities 
uh, to not just present uh, completed thoughts because they're never completed, right? But also because I think there's a performative aspect of it that is important to me and important to to the work. Um, uh, so I want to extend my serious, sincerest gratitude to the Center for Advanced Studies in the Humanities and Social Sciences on Alternative Rationalities and Esoteric Practices from a Global Perspective. Uh, at FAU. Uh, what a name, right? What an amazing, uh, you know, I was trying to figure out an acronym for that. And I was like, I, I would get lost in the acronym. Uh, so I, thank you so much for the kind invitation and organization, especially considering that you just finished the, the center's uh, major conference. Um, I just thank you for being here. I'm sure some of you are worn out from, from hearing about people uh, uh, talking. And I was going to kind of uh, work in a video in, in the PowerPoint a, uh, a little bit differently, but because of the kind of sound issues in the room uh, and because of our limited time, I wanted to just sort of throw you into the field in the same way that I was thrown into it uh, by showing a video to kind of give you a sense of the scale um, uh, of my research site, of what I've what I've been doing for the last 12 years. Um, so if we can just show uh, about four minutes of the video, that would be great. And that's a that's a great stopping place right there. And for those those of you on Zoom, I wasn't getting sound, but I promise there is sound. Uh, it's just a, a case of of making the sound work with the room and Zoom. So you know, it's, I, I I don't know what you got from that very brief kind of that very brief introduction, but I hope what you got is is some of the scale that we're going to be talking about today. Um, so today I want to talk about chased by blessings. This. This is a different uh, kind of approach than, than my dissertation. Hunting baraka is kind of how I phrased it. And yet uh, this is being hunted by baraka, if I was to put it different. It's the metaphysic of the olfactory. So again, to give you kind of a sense of, of what we're talking about here, I spent quite some time in a very time-bound situation writing something for today that really rubbed me the wrong way. It just didn't smell right. So very late last night, I decided that something must be done. Uh, this terrible aroma from this paper was was just ju it was just bothering me. I've been writing in circles. Uh, two very formative experiences while completing my PhD stand out in this moment. Both of revolve around the attempt to bridge this gap between what I'm experiencing and how I've represented what I'm what I'm experiencing, which is of course the <laughs> the, the the issue in anthropology in general. But um, in this case, I injected vulnerability into my work and laid bare what I thought my biases were in order to understand the interaction of my research with the gaze of the ethnographer. However, I write and research as an anthropologist about religion. Uh, my own experience of religion has deeply impacted that from which I seek to study and how I study it. Some of the reasons I think I'm right are rooted in unlearning specific ways uh, of being in the world tied to religion. So the reason I'm stuck 
because in both cases where I injected this kind of vulnerability, and I'm not sure I'm going to fully get to it today, uh, it was rejected, uh, or at least it was it was put in the it was put in the category of theology. It was put in the category of not academic. And yet this research material is very close to the formation of my identity, not my identity it's completely associated with my materials. And yet they're so intertwined. I could separate the two things to write an ethnographically inspired history of a famous Islamic performer. And I feel like the Center for Advanced Studies in Humanities and Social Sciences on Alternative Rationalities and Esoteric Practices from a Global Perspective is probably one of the only places in the world where I could try some autoethnographic work on religion. I'd rather today try to demonstrate an alternative rationality that fully embraces the ethnographer as a member of the assemblage who had to learn to be like a smell while challenging the core definitions of what has come to count as the inquiry into religion as a thing in the world. So hopefully this is your kind of weird. I want to begin with uh, uh, an overview of, of research and some theoretical framing that informs the overall, overall work. As a result of this approach, the concept of baroka, often translated as blessings, emerged from the ethnographic field. During continuing field work and writing sessions in between, I grappled with this term as it wafted through my interviews and observations, I lived the constantly moving performances, and it was not until my interlocutors used the olfactory to describe Baroka that I began to unravel the ineffable that my interlocutors used. I'll use three vignettes, maybe four. We're going to see how it goes today. I'm wafting through this presentation to try to demonstrate the metaphysics of the olfactory. But the key here for me is to use Eduardo Viveros de Castro's kind of perspective um, in, in anthropology. Uh, and this question just is is the at the heart of what I'm, I'm thinking about and trying to do. Couldn't one shift to a perspective showing that the source of the most interesting concepts, problems, entities, and agents introduced into thought by anthropological theory is in the imaginative powers of societies, or better, the peoples and collectives that they propose to explain? And this 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 research that I've been doing is very much uh, uh, I've spent the last 12 years uh, completing ethnographic research on Salawat performed by Habib Sheikh bin Abdul Qadir Asagaf across Indonesia, Malaysia, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Thailand, South Korea, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Yemen and the digital world. His performances have brought millions of people together since 1998. Habib Sheikh has performed more than Beyonce, The Grateful Dead, and most other Western audiences. Sometimes I like to affectionately call him uh, the Southeast Asian Grateful Dead, although I don't think he would approve. The longevity and scale of these performances have made it a challenge to identify what makes this phenomenon popular. You have tens of thousands of people in these spaces. I have grappled with these, perform these performances of Salawat, by Habib Sheikh, from every theoretical basis that I can think of. I've attempted to unveil how approaching the story as an assemblage allows something else to emerge from the ethnographic field. I've used the concept of Baraka that emerged to survey, map, and hang my experience on the already established realms within the academic study of religion and sociocultural anthropology. However, my ethnographic research spending 10, 10, 12 years across six different countries has elicited an, a very uncomfortable reality for me. The insider-outsider dichotomy that sits at the differentiation of religious studies from theology and the ethnographer from, from his or her, their interlocutor presents a map of my work shaped by existing theoretical paradigms that hinder the imagination of realms that are yet to come. I've just begun reshaping my, my dissertation and academic work to more honestly or authentically reflect what emerged from the field uh, during my research and continues to chase me in the present. So today I want to experiment with the materials in a way that firmly locates my experience in the middle of the research and is honest about how Baroka hunted me uh, through the concept of the olfactory. I firmly believe that the decolonization of the study of religion can benefit from a metaphysics of the olfactory in which the old, in which the ethnographer's olfactory system is possessed by the aromas of the ethnographic present 
alongside their interlocutors whether they want to or not now originally i wanted to uh burn some some agar wood in the, in the space there today uh we're not able to do that <clears throat> maybe i can get to, get to the space um and do that but i bet that it smells like something in that room I, I don't know what it is hopefully it's not a bad odor but i bet that there isn't an, an odor an aroma to the room and that you may have first noticed it when you first walked in uh, you you may have noticed certain kinds of smells uh, at different different moments, and this sort of, and this has become an obsession and a fascination for me. The phenomenon of salawat in Islamic society is not new. However, the multiplicities that contemporary salawat brings together and performances of Habib Sheikh are new. I'm going to skip over some of this. I really went hard on some some theory, but I want to get into. Uh, I want to get into the stories because that's really what's uh what we're talking about today because i really really went on about some some theory here that is just boring i don't we're here for the stories fam we're not here for uh for a, a performance of of intellectual curiosity okay so one night in front of habib sheikh's building in solo indonesia during ramadan in 2016 i met with one of habib sheikh's musicians uh, whom I traveled with and became close to. As a part of my research, sometimes I would travel with the musicians who you saw in the video. Sometimes I would travel with Habib Sheikh himself. Sometimes I would travel by myself, which meant that I slept, ate, and lived uh, the sort of the groupy life, if you will, as a part of this, this assemblage. In this moment, we discussed our days and how fasting was going. I then asked him if he could tell me a story about or explain Baroka. The response I had typically received when I asked about Baroka was that it could be felt but not seen, felt but not comprehended. Ditangkap. However, this his response was different. He said, James, Baroka is like a perfume. When you go to this Majlis or Salawat, it rubs off on you. You cannot smell it, but when you leave, others can smell it. It is the best kind of smell. Other people smell it, and it makes them want to also go to the Salawat. This description of Baroka as perfume was initially striking because of the prominence of the olfactory at Habib Sheikh's events. Perfume, which I have, little 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 roll-on perfumes are everywhere being sold. We have oftentimes uh, agar wood being being uh, burned in mass quantities uh, at these events to try to get people. To experience it, so I have a Habib Sheikh approved uh, incense burner and agar wood, um, and agar wood I've written about has is economic implications that we're not going to get into today. But perfume was always a part of the merchants' offerings at the events. I was constantly offered little bottles of non-alcoholic perfume to wipe on my hands and necks. Perfume was often smothered on my hands and clothes, whether I wanted it or not. <laughs> At the end of some salawat vendors, uh, a vendor would actually walk across the stage offering perfume to everyone on the on the stage, wipe the dipstick from the perfume bottle across the hands of all those who reached out. However, perfume was not the only way in which smell rubbed off at the events. I observed a member of Shaker Mania, which is Habib Sheikh's uh, fan club, uh, with a makeshift smoke machine. The machine had a small fan attached behind a container of very hot coals upon which was placed agar wood sending plumes of sweet woody smoke through the cloud through the crowd i began to identify agar wood in the olfactory as an active participant in creating the sensorium of salawat the prevalence of smell however was not simply a way of demarcating space or making the smell of salawat pleasurable thinking back to how the musician put it to me it is also a representation of the way in which baroka uh, operates the way it pulls people to Salawat and extends beyond it. Uh, the Arabic word baroka, plural barokat, is often translated in, into English as blessings, holiness, sanctity, supernatural powers, or charisma. Baroka appears in the Quran 32 times, and the Quran itself is a medium through which baroka can be transferred. It appears in the biographies of Prophet Muhammad in contemporary Islamic discourse. In the anthropology of religion and the scholarly literature on everyday Islam, it has been referred to, but often in passing. It remains on the fringes of what might be considered an object of study. And seeking to illuminate how smell and baroka operate now, 
I would suggest that we can productively turn to Michel de Certeau's uh, Metaphysics of Smell in the possession of Loudin. Smell, writes de Certeau, uh, guarantees judges and precedes seeing. Prior to speech or visualization, baroka is known through smell. And unlike seeing, quote, a space is qualified by olfactory impressions before it can be described or gestured, end quote. Walking into a room, into a space, into a situation filled with agar wood transforms the space before a participant can express what is happening. And I think particularly when I was reading this, this, this work by uh, Desertel, one of the things that struck me is that the possession of, uh, of, of the nuns began uh, through the smell of a musk rose left on the steps. And that has just stuck with me for a very long time. That's that, that right, wrong, it doesn't really matter, but that this whole, uh, this whole phenomenon that's taking place in the possession at Ludan begins with this smell of the musk rose. And in the similar ways, I feel that uh, smell has been a gateway into understanding these phenomenon uh, that could be understood in multiple uh, multiple ways. Smell fills a space in a way that makes it inescapable. Even if you close your nose, odors still reach the olfactory system, the tissue responsible for smelling, through the back of the nose via the breath. To breathe is to smell. Smell is inescapable and even prior to perception. It changes the surface of things before you into a volume in which you are caught. Smell operates, according to Desertot, as an ingenu ingenuous magic that brings into view a new heaven, a new earth, and an infinity of marvels we think are present. Everything must take place as if it were not theater. Everything works thanks to the complicity maintained between an illusionist art and reality. The enchanted sight lets doubt linger and inner time resists the indigenous composition of places. This magic should not be equated with those classic theories of religion, which present magic as a step in the evolutionary development of religion. It is not an index of religious development, but rather indicates the way in which smell creates an enchanted theater, a theater of infinite possibilities, opportunities, movements, and potentiality that proceeds with actors who play the part ensuring its continuation while also somehow being fooled. The theater here is the performance of Salawat, upon which the multiplicity of divergent actors descend. Baroka is the tricky magic that brings an infinity of marvels into the theater of Salawat. The infinity of marvels are those infinite possible manifestation of gifts from God impacting people's social, economic, and spiritual lives. Although I have disagreed with myself about this definition in another piece. So, you know, definition, TBD, still working on it. The new heaven and new earth which arrive in the enchanted theater of Salawat are the visible and invisible world in which Baroka moves like a smell. The collation of this smelly magic creates an enchanted sight that allows doubt to linger, dependent on time, that resists the bounding of space, but will also become affixed in space. Sp smell here appears to operate as both a tactic and a strategy. It is, one, it is at once time-dependent, infinite, and allows for a sight of enchantment, while also at times establishing a place that can be delimited as its own and serve as the base from which relations with an exterior order composed of targets or threats can be managed. The smell of agar wood mixes with other smells to create new spells and will also strike the olfactory system uh, in a way that makes it inescapable. It is my interlocutor's description of Baroka as like a perfume that initially attuned my attention to the prevalence of smell at Salawat. However, if Baroka circulates like a smell through the events through numerous media, it is Habib Sheikh's smelly subjectivity that indicates how ambiguity and normativity act together in creating the conditions under which the unlimited potential emergence of gifts arises. During one of the long car rides with Habib Sheikh, who sometimes when I would travel with him, we would go by car and we would sometimes spend eight hours in the car together and he would he would drill me on my life and continue to ask me for questions and so sometimes uh sometimes i ran out of questions sometimes i just started asking the questions that were on my mind and this is one of those moments where i asked about his relationship with f uh fpe leader habi brizik and the leaders of pasantin kruki because Habib Rizik, FPE, and that community is often found at these events, alongside uh, those of you familiar with this context, Muhammadiyya, Nadalatu Ulama, Shia, Ahmadiyya, Christians, Hindus, uh, it's a very interesting set of 
circumstances that allow these multiple different people and, and Islamic organizations to be present. So I asked him about his, his relationship with Habib Rizik, especially because there had recently been some violence with, with FP in the area. And so I asked, you know, sharing, Habib Sheikh, you're sharing, you're sharing center stage uh, with this guy. You know, what, what does that mean? The Bali bombers of 2002 and 2005 had ties to, to Pasantan Nagruki. You know, what, what does this mean? And he, Habib Sheikh responded, James, they're good men. I know them and have met with them, but the government approached me one year ago to help them stop young people from doing narcotics and drinking alcohol. If I spend time with them or say something that seems to, to agree with them, the government comes and asks me why, I'm, why I am becoming radical. So I have to be like a scent, pinchiuman. Habib Sheikh uses an Indonesian word that captures smell, wind, and scent to describe the way in which he inhabits the world. Agar wood is not simply an element in this assemblage of material practice, but indicates a way of living in the everyday that exists in the in-between or ambiguity, which allows for millions of Indonesians and others from across the world to support these events and contributes to the possibility of the emergence of Baroka. Habib Sheikh's uh, ingenuous magic is defined by his ability to be like a scent. He appeals to many different groups at once through possessing the space of appearing ambiguous. He does not associate himself with one political, religious, or governmental organization. Competing Islamic uh, representatives appear on the same stage in support of Salawad, and events are supported by government officials from different positions. However, in the same way that smell can mix with other smells and move with the wind, smell can also be overpowering and definitive. Habib Sheikh's reiteration of norms and understanding of Islam place in Indonesia uh, reflects Islam and Kafa. In here, I'm sort of referring to Islamic law uh, as a complete method, method for living life in order to prepare for this life and the next, explicating the full range of ideological concepts that Habib Sheikh brings into conversation is not within the purview of this paper, nor is it ex uh, explicating the effective way in which he reinstates norms. Here, I briefly indicate one moment in which he's reiterating norms that are in line with certain interpretations of Islam as foundations for society. However, and this is where I, you know, I want to sort of continue going, um, and I haven't totally figured it out, is that I am not immune to the magic of smell. I am part of the theater of Salawat. I was taught to rub the smell of agar wood into my clothes. Habib Sheikh would often instruct me to rub the smoke emanating from burning agar wood into my beard. It was like he wanted me to catch baroka whether I wanted to or not. My existence in these spaces was often controlled by my interlocutors, and the smell of agar would possess my olfactory senses with varying intensities and in different contexts. However, I became a durable component of this assemblage in a way that challenged my own sense of self and the ability to separate between my, my interlocutors. Um, however, I certainly tried to keep the agreed upon amount of distance. I mounted my motorbike in Jogjakarta, Indonesia, headed to one of the events uh, where Habib Sheikh would perform Salawat near Wonogiri, Indonesia. I popped in my headphones to listen to music and use Google Maps, because at this point, Google Maps was, was working in Indonesia, and so I could get around. Um, the, the, fan, fan, the fan club Facebook page, Shikarmani Apusat, had advertised the event a few days prior, and I wanted to interview some of the merchants who usually began setting up several hours before the event. And that initial video, you can sort of see lights at the back of the crowd, and that's all just tons of tons of different kinds of uh, of things being sold um, that have changed over the years. My trip was going to take around three hours, and I did not know the actual location other than the village name. I took off on my motorbike, not knowing exactly where I was going, per usual. I stopped about halfway through, ate some fried rice, and snacked on baked goods as a large group of Indonesian school teachers sang karaoke at a deafening volume. I texted a member of Habib Sheikh's sound crew to see if I could get a better idea of the location. He did not answer. I smoked a cigarette with one of the older school teachers and explained that I was on my way to Salawat. He asked, well, would you like to sing one of his songs? I responded, no, I have a terrible voice. You'll probably ask me to stop. He laughed and responded, no, of course not. We finished our cigarettes and the school, tester, school teachers posed for several pictures with me and I hopped back on my motorbike. Uh, as I got closer to the village, I noticed flags indicating an event and followed these flags. 
uh, dodging potholes past rice fields and houses, eventually reaching one of the parking areas. Several men stood on the side of the road holding flags and wearing whistles to indicate where people should park. I parked my motorbike and spent 30 minutes discussing the event and each individual's background. Uh, these were locals who were, who were, uh, parkier. uh they were, uh, I don't know, what's the translation, parking attendant? When I asked if they belonged to any uh, particular Islamic organization, one of them responded with, we are Islam. Another man chuckled and said, yes, and that man is a Quranic reciter in the area who could be found most often at Nadalatu Ulama events. There was laughter as this was sort of a, a, fun, a funny joke uh, in this context, and I said that I wanted to talk to the merchants. The sun was setting, and I decided to go forward. As I began walking, uh, one of the men I was just speaking with said, hey, it's a long walk and you're fat. Are you sure you don't want to ride? I laughed, uh, and uh, this was a very common uh, joke in, in this in these spaces, and walked to meet the, the merchants. As I walked down the small street, I noticed that every few feet, a small burned piece of earth marked the side of the road. Multicolored flags flanked both sides of the road. I finally made it to where the merchants were setting up to sell shaker mania gear, food, drinks, hermit crabs, toys, glow sticks, and a wide variety of other things. I knew many of them from the years I had spent following Habib Sheikh. I was immediately greeted by many who were setting up the stands as I made my way to greet all of the sound crew, musicians, and other members of the event that moved every night. I was hoping to fly under the radar at this particular event. However, I was sort of quickly uh, recognized, not just among the merchants, but among people running the event, who then decided to part this crowd of 10,000 people and escort me to the front of the stage reserved for musicians. Um, this was not my plan. I was not planning on uh, going anywhere. So in this picture here, <laughs> this is an event in which I was on stage, uh, uh, but just below this is the musician stage. And this is uh, one of, this became one of the more uh, difficult parts of, of my research that is to say that uh, as soon as I appeared at any of these events, uh, and I've been to over, I don't know, 150, I was I was oftentimes immediately recognized by people I didn't recognize. And I was uh, instructed to sit, interact, be in certain places. Um, and so here uh, I show this picture of Habib Sheikh throwing things because one of his favorite activities oftentimes when I was at these events was while trying to be the good ethnographer, taking notes, scribbling things down, uh, he really liked to throw fruit in my face. Um, I don't know. I, I Later on, I, I think I figured it out. But uh, uh, at this particular event, he didn't know I was coming and he was very excited. Um, and I remember he actually threw a water bottle and I was not paying attention and the water bottle hit me in the face. Uh, luckily, it was not that hard, but we had I had this very interesting relationship with this performer. This 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 smell continues to be sort of a part of this experience. The clothes I'm wearing, I said, what am I, oh, I was sort of preparing uh, for today and I, I had a completely different outfit on. And then I said, well, the whole point about today is is to think about not only how smell as a concept emerges from this ethnographic field, but how it does something to to me as the ethnographer. Um, and one of the things that happened is that uh, Habib Sheikh told me very early on that I was not allowed to worry my, wear my batik. He said, you need to be wearing this kind of clothing. And so he gave a lot of clothing to me, clothing from um, clothing from himself, uh, clothing that he had worn in, in, in the past, which created even more confusing boundaries. Because uh, as you can see in this picture, he's uh, people are rushing towards him and trying to get this thing called baroka from him they're trying to get it from the event it can kind of be understood through this this metaphor of smell that both possesses and dissipates and moves through spaces in unbounded ways um, and yet that same shirt that he's wearing eventually gets on my back and people start coming to me uh, for baroka and I'm not going to get super deep into what that means other than people were trying to come to me for blessings which as an ethnographer is just it's just really confusing and very, uh, very hard to understand. And so I was looking for, eventually there's there's times where, I mean, if you, you look at Mr. Jamie here, this is me out here uh, with Habib Sheikh on stage, I start to look very different maybe than what I looked like when I, when I started. But what I hope for and what I'm trying to get at and what 
I sort of have written out of my work so far is this Barzakian perceptive, is, which is that which ruptures binary outlooks and, and invites us to think beyond the present and visible. How, can, how is smell a representation of this? And how can I take this representation to explain my positionality within this work that is neither insider nor outsider, but rather has to sort of float in between many different uh, many different uh, positionalities. So this phenomenon as an assemblage that becomes territorialized results in a spatio-temporal manifestation of the Barzak, as asserted by my interlocutors. Again, lots of other stories. You'll just have to take it. You just have to, I'll just, just accept that that is a thing that came up. The spatio-temporal moment that marks the opening up of the Barzak is not certainly, not certain or easily tangible. The moment that one tries to define the Barzak or Baroka and its related concept, it slips from being able to be conceptually understood. However, when my interlocutors assert that they come to receive Shafa'at from Prophet Muhammad, who descends into the space of Salawat for a moment to bring them a calm heart, Hatitanang, and Baroka, this is an indication of that moment in which the division between the visible and invisible worlds collide in the Barzak. This Barzak is neither the one nor the other, but which possesses the power of both. This moment and durable component of this assemblage is a moment that is neither defined by the visible nor invisible and yet possesses the power of both. It is in these moments of the Barzak that Baroka, Shafa'at, and Hatitanang are experienced by my interlocutors and rear their head as the movers of this assemblage in the contemporary world. When my interlocutors present these moments in which the visible and invisible indicate a Barzak, however, they are not simply living through it, but imagining. Uh, William Chittick, uh, in expounding upon Ibn Arabi's ideas about existence, uses the following passage to conceptualize how imagination and the Barzakh are connected. A Barzakh is something that separates two other things while never going to one side, as, for example, the line that separates shadow from sunlight. God says, quote, he let forth the two seas that meet together. Between them, Barzakh, they do not overpass with the other. Though since perception might be incapable of separating the two things, the rational faculty judges that there is a barrier between them which separates them. The intelligible barrier is the barzakh. If it is perceived by the senses, it is one of the two things, not the barzakh. At any two adjacent things are in need of a barzakh, which is neither the one nor the other, but which possesses the power of both. The barzakh is something that separates a known from an unknown and existence from a non-existence a negated from an affirmed and intelligible from a non-intelligible. It is called barzak as a technical term, and in itself, it is inintelligible. But it is only imagination, for when you perceive it and are intelligent, you will know that you have perceived an ontological thing upon which your eyes have fallen. But you will know for certain by proofs that there is nothing there in origin or root. So, with, uh, so what is this thing for which you have affirmed an ontological thingness, and from which you have negated that thingness in the state of you affirming it. The barzakh is that space between two things, which is neither the one nor the other. The senses cannot perceive this barrier because to perceive the barrier is to annihilate the possibility of imagining beyond the one and the other. It is in the intellect broadly understood that the barzakh exists as that which is both and not either. For example, the individual who indicates the prophet descends upon Salawat may identify the experience taking place in the space of events, but the invisible realm of the prophets and angels is also simultaneously present for this individual. The Barzakh may not, may not be perceived by the senses, but Ibn Arabi opens up the possibility of imagination, imagination as the Barzakh. Uh, the imagination is the realm in which the Barzakh becomes possible, and the imagination is a barzak which allows the individual to perceive an ontological thing that does not indicate a root or origin. And what I'm trying to get at with all this is that uh, smell as a as a tool, as understood through <laughs> Desertho, is a way of trying to think about the barzak in the sensory environment that is that ruptures some binary outlooks and invites us to think beyond the present and visible. The space in which thinking beyond the present and visible as possible is in this sort of imaginary space with smells and uh, and a host of other things. The ontological thing uh, upon which my eyes have fallen is based on the distinction but interrelated concepts of Shafat, Baraka, and Hatitrang in my work. And so where we're left out here is 
me trying to grapple with the fact that, you know, in many ways I've used smell to think about uh, Habib Sheikh's position. And in turn, it's had this very dramatic uh, impact on how I even see myself, that one has to be, in order to be a part of this assemblage, in order to be an ethnographer in this space, I also had to be a little smelly. I also had to be a little bit in between spaces. I had to, at times, take on the position of the ethnographer, but at times I was thrust into the position of speaking for the U.S. or translating for diplomats or, in this case, on this screen, you know, giving a, a, a speech, Mr. James from USA, uh, about what I had learned. And so, basically, I, I, you know, today I just wanted to introduce my work and also think about what are these as, as these different uh, rationalities and how they how they impact the ethnographer and how the ethnographer story uh, is a part of it? The piece of this that's not here yet is the writing I've been doing from 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 some some deep places uh, about my experience growing up in the rural South um, and what that did to my own conceptions of religion and how that plays into into this work. But I hope what you have gotten from today from this sort of long ramble is just the idea that maybe we can open up a possibility of of an in-between that takes into account the ethnographer's positionality that oftentimes cannot be grasped like the smoke on the screen and yet in multiple smells and in multiple contexts something new is created something emerges from the ethnographic field that continues to be a part of my experience of the world and that is more honest with what i'm actually studying in the world the decolonization of religious studies is is to try to be honest about where I am in this story, uh, rather than pretending that subjectivity is possible when dealing with alternative rationalities and the space of ontology in in doing the work. So I think that's I think I'll stop there. I hope that that was uh, interesting uh, to some of you. Um, I'm happy to 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 discuss what I'm thinking about and how I might move forward with this project. Otherwise, I'm. Uh, I'm just happy that that you listened for as long as you did. <laughs>